Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie. And today, I am very pleased to have with me Eddie Elfenbein. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I've really been enjoying following you uh, on Twitter uh, initially, and now we've gotten to know each other a little bit. And you have such an interesting story that I thought it would be great to explore it here on the show, which is you essentially started out blogging about the markets. That's and right. that was, <laughs> you know, that was a little while ago when you've now parlayed that into man managing a fund and an ETF and creating this list that's uh, very widely followed. So I want to kind of understand what you were doing when you started the blog and how it has grown from there. Sure. I, I started the blog in about 2005. And that's sort of at the time blogging was uh, growing. I think the first person that I read continuously as a blogger was Barry Ritholtz. And I've gotten to know him over the years. What wonderful guy and huge sort of uh, uh, um, motivation and sort of leading me that, you know, you can do something uh, in the blogging world and write something interesting. And it was a very sort of fresh and exciting world. Uh, and this was before the major financial media companies had a web presence. So I remember at one point, Barron's in 2005 uh, featured, they had a little segment that they would feature about bloggers, you know, the, uh, the internet and investing. And it was in October of 2005, I was featured, very, very small blurb in Barron's along with uh, Joe Weisenthal at the same time. And now he's at Bloomberg and his own financial media powerhouse, but we were just two bloggers just starting out. And I even, I remember one of the bloggers uh, was invited on, no, it, okay, it was me. I was invited with, with some others and we were on CNBC and they didn't understand what blogging was. And I was on to talk about the markets and talk about, you know, the Federal Reserve and the uh, interview, the, the woman was treated us like we were kids at the card table. She was like, now what are your bloggers saying? And the, like, she, she thought like the participants were bloggers, not us. So she didn't even understand what we were uh, doing. And we wanted to have these sort of serious discussions about the markets. So it was very odd at the time, but uh, that, was a, that was a fun time uh, when everything got started. I think uh, Twitter has probably done a lot to do away with the, the blogging uh, and, and financial Twitter has probably taken a lot of that over over the years. Yeah, something about blogging seems to lack a sense of authority because I assuming there's such a low barrier to entry, but then you have some of the smartest people in the world putting out blogs. It's hard to sift exactly. through it, but you know the cream rises to the top, so to speak, which I think has happened in your case. Thank you, thank you, I hope so. <laughs> Well, that was about 17 years ago, and you've now turned this into a fund. I, you know, the fund is really interesting to me, and I noticed that you tweeted recently this quote by Peter Lynch that goes, the real key to making money in stocks is not to get scared out of them. And one way to not get scared out of them, this is, you know, end quote, one way to not get scared out of them is to simply not sell the positions except to rebalance maybe once a year, which is the strategy you've developed for this, this ETF that you've launched. That, that, that's, that's, and also the strategy for the fund, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. That, that, that's exactly right. So we start with the buy list on the blog. We started a yearly buy list. It started out as 20 stocks. It's not been expended to, to 25. But we said, here are 20 stocks and uh, they're locked and sealed and we can't touch them for a full year. This list is set. We make absolutely zero changes. And we wanted to try to say to people, look, we'll tie one arm behind our back and we can uh, do better than the market and just as well, if not better than the market. And people think, oh, you're crazy. You have to be able to trade and get in. No, not at all. As long as you have high quality stocks and you don't get scared out of them and the long term you know, time is on your side if you own these very high quality companies. So that was the idea of the buy list that uh, every year we would only change five stocks. And the, at the end of the year, five would come in, five would go out. So at the time it was 25% turnover. Now it's just 20% turnover. And so many people loved the idea of the buy list. And they always would ask, do you manage money? Is there a product for this? And for so many years we said, no, there isn't one. 
And so then in uh, 2016, I was able to connect with a wonderful partner at Advisor Shares. They really have been a ter terrific group, uh, Noah Hammond, who runs that. And we said, let's try to take the buy list. For, for legal reasons, we have to say it's based off the buy list. We can't say it is the buy list. When you run a fund, you have to have some amount of cash just to keep it operational. But we, uh, we, we said in the prospectus, it's going to track this. And we had a track record of the buy list, which has been uh, pretty good over the years. And then so I went from blogging about managing money to actually managing money. My, uh, my father, who's now 87, he said to me, it's a good thing you didn't blog about uh, MMA. So, but now I, uh, I went from, from blogging about something to actually being a practitioner. So it, it is kind of a fascinating job. And then, then you sort of learn that things are quite different in the real world. Uh, for example, uh, with the ETF, well, one is I got to choose a ticker symbol. I'd never done that before. So go through the entire list of tickers. Fortunately, it's crossing Wall Street. So CWS was, uh, was open. So we were able to get that. Um, if the Chicago White Sox want to make me an offer, I'm fully willing to, uh, to hear them out. Um, and then, you know, I, I sat there, you know, when you prepare the fund and they go through all the fees, the listing fees, it goes on the New York, it's the NYSE ARCA for uh, older listeners, you may remember the archipelago, that's what that is. Then there's uh, prospectus fees and there's custodial fees and all these fees. And it's sort of like a cartoon with my eyes, the, the you know, dollar signs, so, so many fees uh, going into it. Um, and when people talk about, oh, the fees in, in funds are so high. Well, when you're at the other end and you realize all that goes in into running that, you're a little more sympathetic. So I had some lessons as, as far as that, but uh, it, it's a great experience and um, you know, just taking that theoretical construct of the buy list and turning it into a, a real product. And we've just recently, we got to new all time highs for the traded shares, for the net asset value and for the uh, total assets under management. So we're in our sixth year now and it's uh, growing and thriving. Yeah, speaking of the theoretical concept behind it, I'm curious about the inspiration, you know, behind the buy list originally, why the 20 stocks, why not 40 stocks? Why not, you know, where did the numbers come from? What, what was the inspiration behind it? Well, I think, I think Louis Rukeyser had sort of a contest on his show or like his, uh, his uh, uh, the, the uh, guest on that show, they did something like that. And I remember a guy I worked with, John Dessauer, he did something like that. So I, I sort of borrowed it from that. And the reason we got to 20 is I feel that's just sort of a good, it's well diversified. You can get into a bunch of uh, fields. And I also feel that that's a good number for the number of companies that I'm familiar with. Once you get beyond that, you know, there's some funds that have uh, dozens and hundreds, and I just, I can't keep track of that many, but 20 to 25, I find that's a, that's sort of a doable, I can, I can, understand it's it's a knowable list and and well diversified what one other question that comes to mind with the rebalancing once a year is how you stick with that i mean i'm guessing you wrote it into the code so to speak so that you can override it with your human biases but i imagine that that's very difficult to kind of maintain that conviction especially if you see a position in there going against you and you got 11 more months to go or you know, whatever it might and be how do you you're, you're exactly right. I mean, look, I'm a human being. And then you, when you see something just getting clobbered, you feel like, no, no, I just want to jump in and pull it out. And I tell you, I bet if I had my opportunity to do that, I, I'm almost positive that would have been a net loser for me. Uh, because at the same time, like, oh, it's gone up so much. Uh, how much further can it go? Well, it can keep going further. Uh, I, I'll give you some examples. Uh, we added Zoetis last year. And it started and it completely flopped out of the gate. I think it was down by about 12% uh, around March. It turned up, you know, it was a 40 odd percent winner for the year. Another good one is Middleby. They make, uh, which we, we recently, just recently sold, 
uh, they make a lot of the kind of industrial baking uh, kitchenware for um, restaurants and hotels. And they got absolutely clobbered for obvious reasons when uh, COVID first came out, uh, all those restaurants shutting down and the stock fell from around 120 to 40 within, I mean, days. It was probably a couple of weeks, but not, not maybe three weeks. And um, it hit bottom and it took off and now we sold it. It's around 200. There's no way I would have predicted that. No way. Now I knew the fact is that I, I liked Middleby. I thought it was a good stock and I thought it would work well for the long term. But as far as if, if I would have picked that bottom and gotten back in, absolutely no way. So the urge is strong, but what I like about my strategy and the rules is it forces this discipline upon me. It says I have to do this. And that's, you know, what it is, getting back to what Peter Lynch said. Another quote from Lynch is that he said that more money has been lost preparing for recessions than the recessions themselves. I don't know if that's literally true, but there's a lot of truth behind that. That really raises the question around how do you know when to sell, right? When it does come time to do that, say if something's been performing well for you very for a very long time, I understand there's some opportunity costs at play, but what are the top, walk us through sort of the metrics you look at or what kind of weighs into that decision to finally sure. replace a different position. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard thing to do because it's, you know, it's selling your darlings. And again, I like it because it doesn't, for, it forces you not to fall in love with companies, you say it's the end of the year, we got to rebalance and we got to prune the list and add new names. Um, so a good example why we sell a stock is they're being bought out. And that happened to us this year with Cerner. Uh, Oracle came along and offered a lot of money <laughs> to, to buy Cerner, uh, all in cash. Oracle is a very, very big company. I believe this would be their largest purchase ever. So with Cerner, which actually had been kind of sluggish for us, Boom, it takes off huge gain in one day on the news. And so at some point, um, uh, that will become part of Oracle. I would imagine that Cerner shareholders will get Oracle shares. So once that happened, we just took it off the list. That decision was kind of made for us. Another reason is sometimes we come off across the valuation. Ansys, which is a wonderful company. I really like this. They make a lot of the sort of 3D computer modeling for engineers. So if you ever see something on a computer screen that's twisting and turning all different ways, it's a good um, shot that comes from ANSYS. And it, it really lowers the cost for engineering uh, uh, projects. Wonderful company. And it took off for us in 2020. Then in 2021, it ran into a brick wall and just didn't, didn't perform as well. And I thought, it's something like 50 times future earnings. I love the company, but that's just too much. So I decided to take that one off the table. And again, like Middleby, which I just mentioned, that had such a big run up. Again, I, I, I thought the valuation was too high. It really comes down to, it's not the thesis that we thought. We were buying it for X, Y, and Z, and the company is now A, B, and C. Another very frustrating one is where I thought we were right was Disney. We, we added uh, uh, Disney and they had absolutely blowout earnings this past year. Just one, I think for the Q4 of 2020, uh, they were expecting to post a big loss. Was yeah, and they posted a, a gain. It was like it was, Wall Street was expecting a forty percent loss, and they had a thirty percent, thirty cent gain. Sorry, and um, you know, really didn't budge at all. And it was very frustrating because I thought we we were right on that. We were right on streaming business, and just got nothing from Disney. And there, I thought, if there's a stock I need to sell, it's time to prune Disney. So sometimes I hope to revisit these as we had with FICO, that's back on the list and we've done it with others. But the, the main thing is if it's not, if it's no longer the stock you originally bought. Well, let's talk about the buy list for 2022 that you just recently published. It's like the horse races started all over again and the bell mm -hmm. just went off and walk us through the qualifiers 
to make the list in the first place? Because when you mentioned valuation there just now, you know, I kind of went through the list. I was doing some back of the envelope math quickly to kind of get a rough feel for valuation on, in my opinion. And I was coming up in for the majority of the stocks, and this is very subjective, but I was coming up with pretty conservative, you know, estimates for, for yield, I guess, you know, we're talking discount rates and expected return. Um, so it seems like a, it, these aren't your high flying tech stocks, you know, in the, in the list, right? And that's right. That brings up a lot of questions. So walk us through what it takes to kind of qualify to be on the list. Um, well, uh, first is I, one important point is since we have 25 stocks and we turn over five each year, that means the average holding period is going to be five years. And when you sit down and you say, okay, is this a stock I am comfortable with owning for the next five years on average, as if I can't touch it for five years. Well, that's not literally true, but it is conceptually that will, will be the average. And is it, you know, is it something um, I'm very willing to do that with? With a company like Hershey, I have a pretty good idea what, what that company is going to look like in five years. With Tesla, eh, I'm not, not so sure about that. Uh, so so that's uh, an important fact. I like to look for, as they come back to always say, uh, companies with a strong market niche. A company that, if not is a literal monopoly, has very much a monopolistic-like control in their industry. Uh, it doesn't have to be you know, exactly like it, but it has some similarities that there's few companies that you can go to to get this service done. Uh, I like uh, companies that have strong, consistent operating histories. I like to see consistently rising uh, earnings and revenue and dividends. Uh, not always, but that's a, a good sign. Um, I don't pay that much attention to uh, industry. For example, I don't have uh, any um, energy stocks. And that's not a prediction about the energy market or oil prices or any geopolitical. I just don't see anything that looks like a really good value at the moment. So it's sort of a bottoms up approach. Uh, but I would say, you know, that I, I don't like the phrase moat, but that that is a good way to describe it. Companies that have a strong mar market position. Why don't you like the phrase moat? I'm curious. I don't know. I just figure it's, uh, it, uh, something about it sounds a little corny, but okay. may, may, maybe enough. it is. Fine. Maybe it is fine. <laughs> no, continue on. I just was curious. Yeah. So I mean, no, I guess I, I guess that that, that uh, best describes it. Uh, the, the list of twenty five. Very interesting. So earlier you were mentioning about it. it this allows you to not fall in love with a, a certain stock, and as you were saying that um, the stock that came to my mind was Moody's which mm -hmm. is a duopoly as you know, it, exactly. it's that description. It's in the portfolio, it's in the buy list. And it is one of the most widely held stocks for a lot of the billionaires that we follow. And, and Buffett comes to mind, he's held it forever, you know, and, and others. And there's a lot of appeal to it, I think for that reason, but um, investors just seem to love this stock. <laughs> That's what came to <laughs> mind. And may, why, why do you think that is exactly besides well, you know, the duopoly? Well, one factor. reason is, it's treated us so well, or <laughs> I think that that reason um, they, uh, you know, if you want to be involved in that field, you basically have to deal with them. There's nobody else you can go to. I think that that it really that's really what it comes down to. Um, so think, on that, so on that note, you know, I made the list again for this year. And until further notice, you know, if we see some kind of disruption to that business, I feel like, is it just going to continue to make the list no matter? I mean, there's probably obviously a price too high at some point, but right. is that- the I, 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 would, I would think so. Um, the, you know, maybe if, if they do an unwise acquisition or something, then I might, again, it's not, it's not the, st the company I originally bought. Uh, so that could happen. Um, and, and there's been often a lot of talk about a player coming in, upsetting the current market segment. Um, I don't see, there's a lot of talk about that. I haven't seen that just yet. Uh, the company just delivers. I mean, year in, year out, it really does. It's sort of, uh, you know, one of these, uh, steady ball players that always, uh, is always there. I was like, you know, 
like Tom Brady going on 44 years and just delivering solid results. It's a wonderful company. So given that you're selling off five stocks a year, this like 20% turnover is, is that mandatory? Do you have to trade out five stocks? Is that part of the regimen? I, I don't, I've always done it. And there's nothing that says in the prospectus that I don't. And so even my, uh, my, my business partner said, why don't you sell out like two or three? Uh, but then I, I think I always want to, I look, <laughs> always, there are uh, other ones I want to add. And, and so it always gets to, to five, uh, you know, when I, when I work towards uh, in, in the closing months of the year, uh, deciding uh, what I want. So yeah, te technically I, I could do that. I haven't done it yet. That's interesting. So and we do the rebalancing. Yeah, that always happens uh, regardless. Right on. So yeah. So something I'm just endlessly fascinated about is how people distill down from this huge universe of stocks. You know, down to say something like twenty. And maybe distillation isn't the right word, but. That to me is how I've been doing it, filtering it through screeners or what, what have you. Is Do you take a quantitative approach uh, to get the lists or the universe down to a certain app, uh, you know, um, a size that's, that's manageable, if you will? So what I do is I have a broader, what I call my watch list. And that's usually I aim for about 100 names. So that's names that I don't know, as I was saying, I, I, know, I can know 25 stocks. 100 stocks, I know, you know, bullet points about it. Uh, and I can know something. And that's sort of my um, uh, sort of triple A for, you know, that, that's where the uh, pool of talent comes for the buy list is, is a company making it into there. And so I'm constantly adding and deleting to, uh, to that. And it's not so much quantitative. Uh, I like to look behind the numbers. I think that's a, a, uh, an issue for many investors. So looking for a company with a strong moat, a strong market position will manifest good numbers. Uh, so if you screen for whatever ROE or whatever kind of numbers, it will come up. But I try to look behind those numbers. You want to look at numbers, but don't be a slave to that. And that's very important. I, I talked about this recently with a stock I like called uh, uh, Amerisaurus Bergen, which is a uh, drug wholesaler. And it's very, very consistent operating history, nice earnings line just going right up. But the stock hasn't moved that much. And by conventional metrics, it's a bargain. It's uh, less than 15 times earnings and just getting this beautiful earnings line going up. Well, the problem is it has, it, it's, open to um, the opioid crisis and litigation from that. So that's sort of weighing on the stock and that can give you without looking behind it, a false sense that this is a value stock. So screening is fine, but it has to be, you have to know more about the company as well. You mentioned value. Is that the school of thought you, you come from when you're you know, when you started out investing, were you following the Ben Graham approach and following the likes of, you know, that kind of philosophy? Yeah, I, no, I would not call myself a strict uh, value investor. I have, you know, a lot of companies which are very much on the growth side of things. So I would not, you know, I, I applaud the tenets of value investing, but I'm not looking to buy, say, a, um, a, a, a B minus stock for a D minus price, because then you're just stuck with a B minus company. I'd rather get, you know, the A plus stock for the best price I can get. Uh, that, that's more important. So I think a value investor is less concerned about the quality of the company, where I'm much more concerned about that. You know, so a company like, you know, Thermo Fisher, Scientific, that's a growth stock. That's a tech stock, you know, just because I, I, I used to have Microsoft, but I don't have, you know, Google or, or Facebook, but that's up there as well. But again, it's, it's got the qualities I like. I noticed a number of, uh, I noticed a number of positions in the buy list offer dividends. Is that something that you factor into the equation at all when you're, when you're considering a stock? 
Um, I can, you know, again, I'll, I'll look at it, but there, there are companies that, that don't pay dividends. But I, more than that, I would like to see the consistent uh, uh, increase in earnings. So uh, Stepin, I think, just had their 54th consecutive uh, dividend increase, and Abbott Labs had their 50th. Uh, 50 straight years of increasing dividends. I think FactSet is up to 17 years, maybe more than that. Um, so it's it's more like a, the, a lot of the companies I look for have those uh, consistent increases. So they do, they have the market position that can manifest those cash flows to supporting those rising dividends. Couple more questions around the, the actual portfolio itself. So in reading some of the comments on the stock positions that you've posted, I noticed this interesting fact about Aflac, and that was that 70% of their revenue comes from Japan. And given I'm in the US and I'm familiar with how much they market here in the US, I just mm -hmm. found that surprising. And it made it into your, uh, you know, your short anecdote or bullet point. I'm just kind of curious what your thought or why that is. It's a fascinating company. So it's originally the American Family Life Assurance Company. It's based in Georgia. It's basically a, a family run company. All the uh, top executives are, are with the Amos family. So I think it was three brothers who started. So now it's all these nephews and cousins that, that own the company been really impressed by them over the years. They're one company they've been on my buy list since the beginning. And what they did was one of the brothers, I think, visited Japan at their World's Fair at Osaka. And he saw all the people walking around with masks on. That was a big deal back then. He realized this is a risk of risk country. And at the time, they, I'm not sure the, 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 the terms of that, but they were sort of legalistic monopolies that the Japanese economy was rent. And Aflac was, uh, allowed to have that. They were benighted to have this uh, important position within the Japanese economy. And so that enabled them to grow very, very quickly. Now they have a big business in the US as well. And everybody knows them about their advertising. They had an interesting uh, uh, crossroads where they went to an advertiser and they said, uh, we've had great business results, but nobody has ever heard of us the American Family Life Assurance Company. So they said, I have a crazy idea. When you say the name of the company, it sounds almost like a duck talking. And they said, let's run an ad of involving a duck. And they ran it on the Fiesta Bowl on January 1st, I think maybe about 20 years ago. And uh, the ad took off and they, they went from something like 20% name recognition to like 97% name recognition. So everybody, and even um, uh, Mrs. Trump was even in uh, an Aflac ad. So now everybody uh, knows the, the duck stock and that just came from their advertising. But I'll give you one example. When uh, there was the awful um, earthquake in Japan a number of years ago, I remember when uh, Dan Amos, the CEO, you know, everybody's sort of worried about what, what's going to happen in the payouts of this. And I remember he said, look, this is what we plan for. You know, when, when we go to work on Monday morning at 9 a.m., this is exactly what we plan for. So sort of, we got this. It's not a big deal. We can take care of that. And it really impressed me, the, the leadership of the company. Um, they ran into some difficulty just being in a low interest rate world. So they made some changes about how they run their uh, their portfolios. But I've even noticed recently, I think the stock just hit a new all time high today. It's over, over 61, maybe $62 per share. So they're, they're one of these, it's sort of like a, a blue blazer. You know, it, it never goes out of style. It's always has a, uh, has a place in a gentleman's uh, wardrobe. That's really interesting because I've had that same concern with Berkshire and Geico and the, the large insurance company that they have, given that interest rates are, are low and, and probably expected to stay low for a considerable amount of time. You mentioned they changed their strategy around that. I'm kind of curious to know more about what that change looks like. I can't, I, I don't know the specifics about this, 
but they, 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 the firm has talked about this in detail about how they've changed their strategy and employing new, uh, different kinds of investments and new uh, portfolio strategies to address this. Um, I, I don't know the exact details about this, but this is something the company has been ahead of the curve on. There's a few other names that stood out to me in the list, just when I was doing those rough valuation calculations, they just kind of popped out as potentially opportunistic. And I, I was kind of curious to get your thoughts on a few of them, just high level, what kind of your your appeal, what the appeal is for you. Uh, one, The first one was Silgan Holdings Inc., if I'm saying that correctly. I hadn't heard of this stock before. It's coming up on our platform with some interesting numbers. Kind of curious to know a little bit more about it. Uh, containers is what they do. And, you know, every, everything you see has got to be shipped and they do everything with, you know, metal containers. They have a very, very strong market position, boring stock, completely uninteresting and very profitable. <laughs> and, and I always find it interesting that there's so much commentary you can find about other stocks. And really nobody talks about this one very much at all, but, but, but wonderfully run company and uh, just consistently churns out very impressive uh, uh, earnings. It, it, it rarely makes it, I don't think Wall Street bets talk, may talk about it very much. Maybe they do, but uh, it, it, it doesn't come up a lot. But I, I, I like boring company, make something everybody needs. Very much a Peter Lynch kind of company. This next company might fit that description as well. I'm not sure, but Science Applications International Corp, S-A-I-C. Talk to us a little bit about this one. Brand new to the portfolio. Cool company based not too far from me in Reston. And uh, they, I, I describe them, probably the best way to describe them is that they're, they're the, the Pentagon's IT help desk. They're, they're tech support for the entire Pentagon. Uh, they also have civilian uh, and things like aerospace and the um, uh, uh, intelligence community they work with as well. Hey, I am so excited about this sponsor that we have. The name of the company is Fold. They have a Visa debit card, and here's the card right here. I use this thing literally every single day. Um, every time I swipe it, I get at least 1% back in, in rewards, and the rewards are in Bitcoin. And um, some of the rewards go as high as 100%. There's even a full Bitcoin that you can win. After you swipe the card, you spin this little wheel on their app, and then it produces the uh, reward, but the lowest uh, reward you'll get is a 1% uh, reward. The thing I really like about this card is um, you can also on their app buy uh, gift cards. And so Amazon is one of the partners that they have, and you can go out and buy an Amazon gift card and you get 5% back when you use this card. And so like all your Christmas shopping or whatever it might be that you're doing on Amazon, you're getting 5% back. It's all paid to you in Bitcoin rewards. You can withdraw those Bitcoin rewards to a self-custody wallet, whatever you want to do with it. There's no gimmicks. There's nothing that you're not seeing up front. Um, it's just an amazing uh, company, an amazing platform. And every single swipe, I'm getting Bitcoin. So I love it. Um, if you want to sign up for this thing, and I'm telling you, this thing is this thing is a no-brainer. Uh, go to foldapp.com slash TIP. That's foldapp.com slash TIP. You'll get 20% off uh, their spin plus annual fee uh, when you sign up uh, with that link. So go to foldapp.com slash TIP. So uh, very, very strong connection. I mean, they're sort of just an outsourcing. They're, they're the Pentagon uh, dressed in, in corporate clothing. They do so much work. Uh, things like getting all of the um, uh, intelligence and, and IT structure behind a new Navy defense systems that will all go through SAIC. And it'll be several different companies working on the, uh, the um, armament system and SAIC sort of brings it all together. The company was started by an interesting guy who was very much a pioneer in the employee employee ownership company. And so they had a huge amount of the company was owned by the employees and many people made a huge amount of money. Now that, that changed a lot once they had uh, their IPO. 
But again, it's one of those companies that isn't talked about a lot, but very, very impressive. Again, you know, if you want something done, you can go to a SAIC or pretty much nobody else. So if you, if you have a big defense system, you want to get the IT architecture behind it, they're the ones you got to go to, or they're sort of first on your list. Now, this next one I'm, I'm very curious about, Reynolds Consumer Products, mm -hmm. R-E-Y-N. -E and I'm curious about it mainly because it seems like the free cash flow really took a dive through COVID. And it sounds like you know, this is added to your portfolio. Is there a turnaround of events that you expect for this company? What, how, you know, where's the bullishness coming from here? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's uh, Reynolds wrap, it's hefty bags. It's uh, not literally the solo cuts, but it's the party cups. I mean, it's it, they're in ninety five percent of U.S. households. They just make you know stuff that that make uh, behind running a house. What I really like is they're the exclusive, exclusive private label just dis, uh, distributor for Amazon. Remarkable uh, position they have there. I like I love a lot of uh, consumer staple stocks. Um, so I, I do see a, a bright uh, future for them, despite this stumbling during the COVID. I think that uh, maybe uh, gave us a bit of an opportunity to add them. Cool company. Now, the last question I have about the buy list is how much sector exposure you weigh into the allocation. So for example, I took a look at the list and the breakdown is roughly 19% healthcare, 16% financials, 16% information technology, 12% materials, 20% industrials. Again, I'm rounding 13% consumer staples, 4% consumer discretionary. If you go over, say like 20% in a certain sector, you said you were kind of agnostic to sector earlier, but I'm curious, there's a certain weight that I, I imagine you consider. You don't wanna be 100% necessarily maybe one thing. Would you think about changing the allocation if you were mm -hmm. hitting a certain threshold? I have to say, it's kind of fascinating hearing you say that because I've never calculated it for, and I'm, I was actually, I was actually impressed. It seemed pretty fairly well divided among among the uh, the groups. Um, so there there are certain companies I really like to add. Uh, for example, I love you know Hershey's, Church and Dwight, these consumer staple stocks, and Reynolds. I lo love those kinds of companies. Very consistent. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's they're easy businesses to follow. I mean, you get a 10K and you see pretty much what's going on. No, no, no bizarre uh, uh, embryonic industries to, or technologies uh, sh shaking things up. Other companies, I, I'm a I'm big fan of uh, medical device companies um, and, you know, medical, medical uh, devices, uh, you know, striker companies like that. Um, so I'm always worried about adding too many of those kinds of companies, um, but it's not an overwhelming urge. A lot of it, I really just look for the best company. And I'm, I gotta say, I'm surprised by it uh, falling out that way. I would think the ones I don't have are the financials, of course I have Affleck, and the energy. But even energy, it's now it's a very small part of the S&P 500. It's probably about three or 4%. So that would come to maybe one name, but I, I know you know when when there's a big day for energy uh, on the market. I know you know usually we're going to lag, and if there's a bad day for energy, usually we're going to do well. It's not. I, I don't follow any rules as far as that. It's all bottom up, up, and it's sort of worked out that way. If it did get you know really slanted, like thirty percent or more to one company, then I would probably consider. It, it, but uh, up till now, it's just not, it's never been a foremost concern of mine. Very interesting. Well, I definitely wanted to save some time to move on from the, the buy list because you write consistently about the markets and the economy in general. And I really wanted to get into some of that. So your latest report was talking a lot about jobs, mainly that the US had created nearly 200,000 jobs, but it was well below expectation. How do we read into that exactly? That is a good question. I don't. I don't know exactly. Uh, you know, we 
We came in less than half of expectations. And then earlier this week, we got the ADP report, which doubled expectations, more than doubled expectations. So we got this huge increase and also a huge beat and a huge miss. Um, I think the economy is still growing. And I think the Federal Reserve is going to be focused on raising interest rates this year three times, perhaps four times this year. In fact, I think there's a good chance it will become four rate increases. We're at a very bizarre point in the economy. I did a tweet today. Right now, the uh, unemployment rate is lower today than it was at any point during the 1970s, the 1980s, and the 1990s, during that uh, entire period. But we get this odd thing where a lot of people, particularly people in that sort of late 50s, early 60s age group who maybe had planning on retiring in a few years, they're retiring right now. So we see at one end that work uh, force is getting smaller. So less people looking for work. In the younger age cohorts, it hasn't had a big shift among those. It, that we need to see more people in the workforce, but that, that's not as large as a lot of people um, assume. So we have this odd thing of you know, uh, increasing inflation, low interest rates, a low uh, employment and lagging uh, uh, workforce participation. Of course, there's still COVID, so people are just plain nervous about going back to school. Uh, for a lot of families, uh, childcare, that's a major issue. You can't somebody look after uh, the kids so they can go. And then, you know, with remote learning and things like that at school, that plays into it. So all of these things are going on at the same time. I've never seen anything quite like this. So the jobs miss surprised me just as much as anybody. We are seeing the increase in uh, uh, earnings as pay. People are, you know, workers are getting more pay, but a lot of that's being eaten right back up by, uh, by inflation. Inflation is particularly cruel on lower income people. It hits you at the gas tank. It hits you in you know, milk and eggs and things like that. Uh, so a lot of the gains that people have really workers have not seen anything like this in decades where they've been on the upper hand. We saw the recent report this week, an all-time record number of Americans quit their jobs in November. There's something like 10 million jobs that uh, help is wanted for, and we can't fill them all. So it's sort of all these cross currents going on at once. It's all from COVID and trying to get back to COVID. I don't think the unemployment benefits are such a huge variable, but I think that plays into it as well. So um, I really don't think I answered it all <laughs> for saying that uh, it's, it's a difficult position where the economy is right now. Um, and it's just being, of course, we don't know what will happen with the Omicron as well. It, it, I'm in Washington and next week we're gonna go to uh, vaccine passports. So I don't know how or when this will all end. Now, the markets, the week we're recording, which is the first week of January, is, you know, experienced somewhat of a, a tantrum again. And the U.S. tenure has been inching upward. It's at 1.76% as of today, which is essentially pre-COVID numbers. It was back flirting with these numbers, you know, um, about a year ago. But this is where we were, this is where we were right before the big drop in in this uh, in yield. I'm kind of curious if you think this gain in uh, in rates maybe has to do with people expecting a lack of liquidity and the Fed to actually raise rates over the next year or two. Is that why we're seeing a, a dip here? And, and do you have any forecasts where we go? Uh I think that's exactly right. I think you're exactly right. And we saw this. I mean, you can see it happened this week when the Fed released the minutes from their last meeting. This was the meeting in mid-December. Now, if you remember at that meeting, the Federal Reserve, when the Fed decided to ramp up its tapering. So it's, it was going to pull back its bond buying at a faster rate than they had originally planned. 
So when the minutes came out this week, the description of the debate among the Fed participants showed that there was a greater concern about the direction of, or the need to raise interest rates. That spooked the market. You can see it was right at 2 p.m. on Wednesday. Everything changed and the market started to pull back and had that sort of a temper tantrum. I got to say, for me speaking, I wasn't particularly surprised. I thought the Fed had sort of had been suggesting that very strongly in their actions and in their speeches and comments. Perhaps it was just actually seeing it in the, uh, in the Fed minutes convinced in, in Wall Street investors that this was really going to happen. Uh, but yeah, that, that's why I think there's a good chance we're going to see maybe uh, four rate heights next year. And here we are where the 10-year, the benchmark is at one and three quarters, and we're still getting six, seven percent inflation. We're going to get the CPI report next week. And I think the year over year rate of inflation will be in excess of seven percent. So I assume that the market believes that this inflation will cool off at some point. That could be right. That could be. I haven't seen the evidence for it just yet. Very interesting. I'm I'm actually just pulling up your um, couple of your recent writings, uh, something I hadn't seen yet, so I'm kind of just curious about it. Um, by the way, you can see my writings at uh, cws.substack.com. And I have a, a free version that goes out on Tuesday and a paid version that goes out uh, Friday morning. I'm, I'm wondering why you, okay, interesting. Um, all right. Would you say that that is the biggest risk to markets at the moment, as far as you can see? I mean, obviously there's unknowns out there. We don't know everything, especially with the Omicron stuff, but as far as investors who are wanting to put money to work right now, should they hesitate? Should they, you know, be reluctant to put markets or to put money into the markets at this time? Well, it depends what, what you buy, but I don't, I don't think there's any hesitation for buying shares of Church and Dwight. Uh, I mean, it's it's baking soda and condoms. I don't think that's going to be terribly effective. That's that, that's all. That's always going to be with us. Um, so you know what you say. The the scariest known uh, uh, concerns would be inflation. I would say that that's uh, top of the line, and any sort of economic weakness. Of course, there are the unknown ones. We don't know what those could be. Uh, but I would say I, I see no particular reason why investors should be afraid of investing in high quality stocks like you find in the ETF right now. Yeah, I noticed the ETF was, you know, I would say defensive of sorts would be kind of a, a term mm -hmm. that comes to mind. Is that intentional? Um, I guess it, it sort of comes out that way. I wouldn't say intentional, but for the kind of companies I, I look at, it, it comes out that as well. I'd say high quality defensive oriented portfolio. Now the buy list of 25 stocks, obviously you don't fall in love with any of them. Is there one in particular that you're very excited about though? Is there one that you're like, you think might be the best opportunity of the bunch? Oh boy. Uh, you know, it's funny because uh, it's always the big winner of it each year completely surprises me. I, it's like I never would have would have guessed that one. I have a soft spot in my heart for Miller Industries, which is by far the smallest company. Uh, I think it's Step In, which we mentioned before. It's something like six times larger, and that's the second smallest. And Miller uh, makes uh, towing and recovery uh, equipment. Uh, they uh, very much, very close to a, a monopoly. They're not followed by any analyst. And last year when we added them, they started very well for us. And then they had a very uh, bad, I mean, they were down 10, 12% or something for the year, swimming against a, a pretty strong year. So I like, I, there's something I really like about this company. It's kind of an off, uh, off the beaten path company. They said no analysts follow it. So when you come out earnings, 
did they beat or did they miss? We can't say. <laughs> um, so that's, and since it's so small, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it gets a big jump in the year ahead. So that's the one that really has a soft spot uh, for me. I think it's a cool company. You know, the strategy somewhat brings to mind the magic formula by Joel Greenblatt, at least the rebalancing or lack thereof, you know, the infrequency of that. And I was actually surprised to hear when I asked you about it, that you didn't say, well, we back tested this thing 40 odd years, and this is how it came, it came out. And so this is why we have the, uh, you know, the um, uh, conviction that we have, but it doesn't sound like that's quite the case. Um, it sounds like yeah. it's a much more quanti uh, qualitative approach. No, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that that's a problem that investors have. It's not about the numbers, it's about the story behind the numbers. It's not the, you know buying a low PE ratio, it's about getting a value stock. It's, it's about, uh, you know, look what, what makes the numbers go. Don't look at the numbers themselves. A lot of people, uh, I've noticed it over my years in investing, a lot of people on Wall Street who are interested in investing, they are, I always get this backwards, I think they're right side people. It's the very rational part of the brain. But you also sort of need that creative uh, side of the brain to be able to look at what the companies do and how they uh, what, what they address in a marketplace that uh, you can't quite see on a balance sheet. And that's uh, a key to investing that I've learned to appreciate over the years. One thing our listeners love to learn about are books that have really inspired or influenced the way that you invest. So I'm curious if there's some that you gift most to other people or one that kind of sit on your bookshelf is the most cherished books that really got you to where you are on the investing piece. To clarify, it could also be philosophical, any other, it doesn't have to be an investing book. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, on the investing, I think something like One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch probably had the most impact on me, uh, just understanding how, you know, what, what really works in the market and, uh, you know, the, the, the right ways to think about investing. Um, a lot of you know Warren Buffett's essays, his uh, yearly shareholder uh, uh, letters, lots of great nuggets of wisdom in in that. Again, not you know it doesn't tell you what to invest in, but it tells you how to think about the markets, how to think about investing. So I'd say th those are sort of the two of the the bedrocks of the industry uh, of of the financial book world. Fantastic. Well, Eddie, before I let you go, I want to make sure I give you the opportunity to hand off to the audience where they can learn about you, where they can learn about the buy list, crossing Wall Street, any other resources you want to share? Sure, sure. Well, as I said, you can get my uh, sub stack. So that's cws.substack.com. And I have a, um, a more general interest uh, newsletter that goes out on Tuesday that's free. And then if you want to get the uh, the premium one, that goes out very late Thursday night. We date it uh, for Friday. So at uh, cws.substack.com. And then there is the ETF. And let me get that. The website is uh, advisorshares.com. Um, uh, okay, it's advisorshares.com uh, backslash ETFs backslash CWS. Uh, if you just go to Advisor Shares, you can find CWS there. And that's a great web page because it has all the information about uh, you know, the net asset value. And we have our customer service uh, team there that can help you out. Um, so anything about that, you always know exactly what's in the ETF. It's the same as what's on the buy list. So you get that uh, absolute transparency. One other thing about the ETF, we were the very first ETF to have a fulcrum fee, which uh, basically means that if the fund does better, I get a little uh, bonus comes to me. If the fund uh, trails the benchmark, which is the S&P 500, then uh, shareholders get a little savings. So that did exist in the open end phase. I think Fidelity had a bunch of fulcrum fees, but we were the very first one uh, ETF to have the fulcrum fee uh, in that space, more have joined in, but our little fun, we were the first one to do it. Very cool. 
Well, I really enjoyed this and I love your takes on Twitter and this was a really fun discussion. So I, I hope we can do it again sometime soon. I'm really eager to maybe catch up a year from now and see how the bylist has performed and, and catching up much. on the horse rate. Thank you very much for having me. All right, cheers. Thank you so much, Eddie. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.